the stated purists among you will already frown upon the title of this presentation because the commission procedure to keep on the cost of review all system of state aid is in the plural, why there is only one procedure, strictly speaking, to keep existing aid uh, under control. And why is that so? Because we are today speaking of existing aid in a very non-technical way. Uh, existing aid is defined in the procedural regulation, in Article 1 of the procedural regulation, as aid that has either been approved or that is block exempted or that has become existing aid because of the elapsing of the time period for recovering such, uh, such aid. Well, today we will speak about existing aid in a factual sense. So all aid that is de facto out there, not in a technical way. That's why the procedures become plural. And the other reason for them becoming, becoming in the plural is that the first procedure we will be talking about is actually not the procedure which is uh, the monitoring exercise that the Commission runs every year on block exempted and approved aid, which is not proceduralized in any way or form. It's completely outside the procedural. So let's see at the list of the procedures. So we will look briefly into the legal basis of the, the power of the Commission to look into existing aid procedures and the uh, in cooperation with the member state. And then, as said, the first thing we will be looking into is the non-procedure, so it's the monitoring exercise that the Commission runs every year. Then the second one will be uh, the procedure for looking in something that does not qualify as uh, existing aid under the procedural regulation, so uh, into illegal aid. And uh, again, uh, we will be referring very quickly to the procedure for misuse of aid, which is uh, as you will see in one slide, we finally get to the only procedure for uh, looking into existing aid, which is the so-called existing aid procedure. And uh, finally, we touch upon uh, sector inquiries, which is, uh, as uh, referred to earlier, a novelty of the uh, procedural regulation as from 2013 as from. <coughs> so moving on, the, the legal basis. Article 1081 provides the legal basis for our discussion today. So Article 1081 provides that the Commission, in cooperation with the Member State, shall keep a, a, under constant review all system of aid existing in all Member States. A and then, since we are talking about existing aid in a broader sense, in a factual sense rather than in a legal sense, uh, there is also reference to Article 1083, which is uh, the one, the, basically the standstill clause, the one containing the standstill clause, that is, that is the one violated by all aid that is then uh, to be considered illegal. 1081 is not the only treaty provision that is relevant in this context. There is also Article 43 of the Treaty on the European Union, which provides that member states and the Commission must loyally cooperate in carrying on all the tasks that they have to do under the treaty. And of course, uh, enforcing state aid law is one of those tasks. So uh, the, the courts have already said it many, many times, uh, many, many times under state aid law, since state aid is one of the pillars of the treaty, one of the pillars of the internal market, and therefore one of the pillars of the treaties, this duty of cooperation is a reinforced duty of cooperation between the Commission and the Member States. And when we say between the Commission and the Member States, we say between the Commission and all ramifications of the Member States, including the judiciary, of course. Uh, Speaking of which, it, is, it was rendered in another, in another context, actually in the criminal law context, but uh, already in the late 80s, the Court of Justice said that the duty of loyal cooperation is a reinforced duty between the Commission and the courts, because the national courts are actually EU courts of, of, first, of first instance, and that's very relevant uh, when it comes to uh, these role of national courts, which will be discussed today, uh, later in the afternoon, in enforcing state aid. Let's move to secondary legislation. 
And this here is the article of the procedural regulation that makes direct reference to Article 1081. As I said, is the, this article uh, is basically also the legal basis for the real existing aid procedure under the uh, procedural the procedure regulation. But reading it broadly, and uh, we have done uh, so uh, lately, it's also the article in the procedural regulation that gives us a legal basis for, more, for running the uh, annual monitoring exercise. So once we have quickly seen the legal basis, the general legal basis for uh, the subject matter of our discussion this morning, we move to the first of these procedures slash non-procedures, which is monitoring. As already hinted to earlier, Monitoring has become important in, uh, in recent years. The, actually, the Court of Auditors already in 2011, so uh, as you will recall from the discussion earlier uh, this morning, before some was uh, even put uh, forth in the communication of uh, 2012, already at that time, the Court of Auditors uh, told the Commission, you should step up your efforts because there is a lot of aid which is not looked at upfront, but it's, but it's given by member states. Uh, and you should really step up your efforts in uh, looking at that aid and being sure that that aid is compliant with uh, union law. Um, in the wake of that, in uh, the uh, opinion given by the Parliament on the uh, state aid modernization communication, the Parliament explicitly said that the other side of the coin of stated modernization, uh, particularly of the uh, of broadening the jibber, is that the Commission should also broaden monitoring, meaning giving more power to member states, mean giving more freedom, leeway to member states, add as a countervailing measure the fact that the Commission should look really closely at how uh, these uh, measures are in the end implemented in the uh, in the relevant member state just to give you a bit of a, a bit of a flavor in uh, 2002 we were we had uh, some 2600 measures out of 3800 which were block exempted so you see that the court of auditor already at the time had a point in saying there is a lot of aid which is given under the block exempted regulation and in 2015, which is the last year for which we have complete data, because we are almost always one year behind, because we need to get the data from, uh, from member states, we have uh, 30,650 uh, uh, block exempted measures out of 4,550. Um, when we are given these numbers, what we are talking about is not the measures implemented in that year, but it's all the measures under which member states report expenditures in that year. So it might be that the measure is 10 years old, but the member state is still spending on it. So if you think about that, you see that this number, this proportion is only going to increase because of course you have a huge stock of old measures which could not be block exempted under the new block exempted regulation to which you add the newer measures. And that's also why the, the second line here, the red line, uh, hasn't increased as dramatically as the blue line. Because when you introduce a measure, you will start spending on that measure the year thereafter, sometimes two years thereafter. So if you look at 2015 measures, the expenditures that were possible on new GBER measures, which was introduced just one year uh, or one year and a half before, was not that much. So we are expecting, actually we know already that new measures are almost 90% uh, under GBER, and we are expecting also that this red uh, red line would go in the region more of 70% in the in, in the next years. So uh, we are talking uh, about, about uh, huge numbers and numbers that cannot go uh, undetected because the overall uh, impact on the market of those number is uh, quite uh, quite simple. The size covers both uh, 
approved measures <coughs> and block exempted measures. For the approved measures, we have under the procedural regulation a reporting obligation uh, on, uh, on the member states, which is in Article 26.1 of the consolidated regulation, of the, the codified regulation. Um, and there is also provision which I put up there, but uh, it not very much used. Uh, I cannot actually recall one instance in which it was used, which allows the Commission to carry on on-site inspections to see on-site uh, how, uh, in a sort of antitrust way, uh, how uh, decisions are implemented. As I said, it's not. Uh, not I'm not sure it has ever been, uh, been used. And that's the legal basis for uh, monitoring, or actually for having information then to monitor uh, approved measures. The uh, legal basis for uh, having the information to monitor uh, block exempted measures is uh, contained in the block exemption regulation it, uh, itself. Um, and it provides that member states must submit reports, well, they must submit an info sheet uh, 20 days after implementing uh, implementing the measure under the block exemption, informing the Commission what the measure is about, what the expenditures are, who, what type of beneficiaries are uh, to be covered by the measures, and what is the expected overall and annual budget of the measure. And then, this is the source of the uh, information that we have seen in the first graph. Yearly, they have to report the expenditures under each individual measure. So that red line was basically the accumulation of all this information which is reported yearly by, by member states. On the basis basically of this yearly report, <coughs> then the Commission selects the cases that are to be monitored each, each year. So basically we look at all <coughs> All measures. So you have seen what we would look at uh, in 2015 uh, is some 4,500 uh, measures, both approved and block exempted. We go through the list of all measures that have uh, expenditures, that have expenditures reported, and then we try in that list to find a number, a significant number of cases that would cover all or almost all member states, but uh, every two years we cover all member states. It is uh, very rare uh, that uh, we uh, lack more than one or two member states per year. It happens with very small member states. You can't really monitor every year Malta because you would be monitoring the same scheme always. <coughs> so uh, you have to have some flexibility on that. Um, and also all types of aid and all types of uh, aid measures, meaning so grants, loans. Okay. Uh, the, the, the principle is that to be meaningful, we uh, monitor uh, mainly mainly yeah, schemes. Yeah. Uh, on decisions, we m can monitor also individual aids, but it's very rare that we do. For practical reasons. Well, for one practical reason is that usually when uh, an individual aid is found to be particularly problematic, there would be at that point a monitoring clause in the decision approving it itself. So that's outside the monitoring exercise, but it's monitoring done under the decision, the decision itself. Mm -hmm. So there would be enhanced reporting obligation under that scheme is the case, for example, of most of the banking price cases in which banks had to uh, undergo a sort of audit for a certain period of time to certify that they would comply with the, uh, with the commitments that they gave in order to be able to, to get the aid in the first place. So that's why uh, the, there is this sort of uh, difference between uh, hmm. normal monitoring and monitoring. For you. Yeah. <laughs> then, once we have a list, we will be doing two types of monitoring each year. The classical one that we have been doing since 2006, meaning we look at the legal basis and we look at how the legal basis has been implemented. As from some, as from 2014, actually as from the 2015 monitoring exercise, we, we have also added what is called a real-time monitoring exercise. Why so? Uh, Again, 
much more leeway in the hands of the member states, much more responsibility in the hands of the member states that has not only corresponded to an increased monitoring, but also in an increased availability of the Commission to cooperate with member states in ensuring that the beneficiaries would enjoy legal certainty under the schemes and that the uh, schemes are implemented correctly. That, from for what concerns us here in the monitoring, means that we would monitor schemes that are in a very early stage of implementation in which uh, expenditures are not yet reported, which increases the number of schemes that we look at from 4,500 to actually 7,000. And look at whether the legal basis is written in a way that would prevent problems later on. So we would just look at the legal basis, look at whether it's corrected, corrected, correctly sorry, implementing the, the GBER, so as to prevent that any illegal aid is granted under that national legal basis. Uh, it was mentioned uh, before, just to give you a flavor, the other way, the other two ways the Commission is helping member states in implementing GBER is one, these comfort letters, which are from time to time requested by member states to be sure that uh, the, the measure that they have in mind is actually GBER conform, or uh, replying to questions on the GBER itself. Just to give you an idea, we have replied so far to some 750 questions on the GDPR, which means that it's an easy piece of legislation. Uh, on particular parts of the GDPR, even more, I think the uh, aid and environmental part of GDPR has reached more than uh, between 150 and 200 questions so far. But back to monitoring. So how does it work? We write to the member state. We tell them, uh, look, this year this uh, scheme has been selected for, for being monitoring, for being part of the monitoring exercise. Please provide primary and secondary legislation implementing the scheme and also a list of all beneficiaries in which, uh, to, to which aid was granted under the scheme in years uh, minus two, so two years back, and minus three. We normally receive that information, so the first thing that we do is to look into the legal basis, and that is common to the classical, uh, the classic and the real-time monitoring, and then we look at the list of beneficiaries and then randomly select a number of beneficiaries to then uh, prepare the second request of information in which we would request the member state to provide us all the documentation of aid granted to those individual beneficiaries under the monitoring scheme. Depending on how complex is the assessment of the individual aid granted under, uh, granted under the scheme, this would take between two, three, four requests for information. But we uh, usually strive to keep this under the uh, year. It's usually an yearly cycle, and we try to close it within within the year. Then, once we have gone through our two, three requests for information, we then have a final assessment of, of the case, and we write a final letter to the member state. Uh, the most welcome outcome is, of course, the, the first one. We detected no irregularities in the legal basis and no irregularity in the implementation of the scheme. So we basically uh, tell the member state, good job. Thanks for having allowed us to monitor the scheme. It's perfect to go on like that. Uh, in some cases, we find some irregularities, some conditions that are not perfectly clear, that are missing but implemented in practice. So uh, a number of, um, and we'll come back to that a bit later on the efforts of this, a number of small irregularities that are purely procedural and do not impact real compatibility, but uh, as the, uh, Gen the Court of Justice has told us in Dillis Wellness, they do impact compatibility. Um, we have another step of irregularity, which is wrong provisions in the legal, in the legal basis. It's not really only unclear or, some, or missing, but it's provisions <coughs> that are really running a fall of the, uh, of the block exemption regulation or of the decision. And then we ask the member state to change that, 
and if it, the member state doesn't, we take action uh, against them. But it's very rare that a member state receiving such a letter does not act upon uh, upon such a, such an indication and does not change the, the legal basis. Uh, we might then find that those irregularities have, have given rise to some irregularities in the implementation, uh, but not systemic. So what we ask again is the member state to uh, correct those irregularities by voluntarily recovering any excess aid that has been granted, particularly when the irregularities affect the uh, aid ceilings or the aid intensities that are allowed under the decision or the exemption <coughs> regulation. And then if really the issue is systemic, we might uh, have to uh, take formal, formal action against member states. So to give you an idea, uh, between uh, 2006 and last year, we have monitored some 470 schemes. We have found irregularities in roughly one third of, uh, of the cases. Uh, in some, a part was irregularities. Well, there is a portion that is still yet unclear, meaning that the cases are still under investigation, so we could not take a final view on whether the, the case was fine or not. Uh, some of the irregularities are clearly not affecting compatibility. Other irregularities are a bit more borderline and might affect compatibility. What are those irregularities that we have been talking about? So uh, different uh, types of irregularities can be, as we said, on the legal basis. The most common thing is that there would be some conditions missing in the legal basis. And the most common conditions missing in the legal basis is, for example, the uh, so-called uh, Degendorf clause, meaning the clause excluding companies that uh, are the addressees of a pending recovery order from getting aid under the uh, block exemption regulation or even under the decision. It's, of course, a condition that, even though we are quite attached to, uh, very rarely gives rise to regularity in the implementation phase because you need to actually grant aid to a company that has an outstanding recovery orders and there are luckily enough not too many around Europe. So uh, statistically speaking, it's very difficult that the, this missing condition actually causes a, a problem in implementation, but still <coughs> is important. Uh, there are often Missing are uh, references to aid intensities, aid ceilings, uh, or exclusions of uh, firms in difficulty. The fact that th those conditions are missing in the legal basis does not automatically mean that they are not implemented in practice. That's why we have said uh, there, there is a, a big difference between a missing condition and uh, so something that is formal and procedural and something that really affects compatibility. Uh, of course, if you think about it, uh, the fact that no reference to aid intensities uh, is there can give rise to a huge problem of compatibility because access aid can be granted. So it's potentially affecting compatibility, but not as necessarily actually affecting compatibility. And sometimes the second, uh, sometimes, as we said, we have wrong provisions. And wrong provisions are most often uh, provisions that allow aid to uh, companies, uh, actually, sorry, to sectors that are excluded from the GBER, for example. We have heard earlier that some sectors, <coughs> or that impose conditions like the use of local uh, products, which, again, run a fall of, uh, of GBER, run a fall actually of, of the treaty and then of, of GBER. Again, only when the condition is uh, implemented in practice, so is enforced in practice, it gives rise to uh, compatibility problems. If it, it's not implemented in practice, it's not problematic in the S, problematic in the end. So those are the conditions that we would consider normally purely procedural, but as hinted to earlier, the Court of Justice has told us that even a very, very procedural 
uh, requirement such indicating in the legal basis that the legal basis is implemented under the block exit actually in that case under the old block exempted <laughs> regulation gives rise to compatibility problems because the court uh, of justice in the Dillis Wellness Hotel uh, preliminary ruling has told us that since the rule is you have to notify under 1083 the jibber is an exception and is an exception that has to be interpreted very strictly <laughs> article 31 of the previous jibber the 800 uh, 2008 explicitly said that all compatibility conditions uh, included in the jibber must be complied with for the measure to be covered by the jibber itself. Article 3 of the current jibber says almost the same thing, so we are in the same environment. Whenever one of the compatibility conditions and under our Regulation 800, the mentioning of the uh, jibber as a legal basis one, was one of these compatibility conditions, Whenever one of them is not complied, D8 is not compatible under the GBER. It could still be compatible under a guideline, but of course, requirements of the guidelines are usually much stricter than GBER requirements. So you might find yourself in a situation in which A is not compatible under GBER because of a procedural uh, irregularity and is not compatible under a guideline simply because the guideline is in principle stricter, so requires more compatibility requirements than the GBER does. Those cases uh, would turn to be quite, quite problematic. You see that, briefly, speak, uh, briefly hinting to it, we have highlighted a may in the first uh, sentence of Article 12.1 of the Procedural Regulation and the shell in the second sentence. And that's the novelty, exactly the novelty that Professor Essas was referring to before of the 2013 amendments to the procedural regulations. We uh, will see later on uh, what that, uh, that means. And the other novelty is the uh, new part of uh, what was at the time Article 20 and became Article 24.2, which says that uh, interested parties may submit complaints and to do so, they have to comply or to, to, to fill in a um, compulsory form uh, providing the Commission with all information provided. Uh, it's not on the slide, just to recall it to you. Who is an interested party is defined by the regulation uh, itself. It's defined by Article 1H of uh, the Procedural Regulation, which as way of an example, it's not a, a closed list says that interest parties are other member states, of course, beneficiaries, competitors, and trade associations. And by and giving a more general description of interest party, everybody who is directly affected by the measure is an interested party, which is more or less, even a, a bit less strict, uh, the same definition that the court gives uh, when uh, it looks at standing. So, moving uh, uh, from, uh, from the legal basis to what the legal basis mean, uh, means in practice, there are two entry points for the uh, illegal aid procedure. One entry point is the uh, so-called ex-officio procedure. Uh, we have hinted to it many, many times this morning. All the uh, quite well-known tax cases we have been uh, discussing this morning are ex-officio procedure meaning that the Commission acts on its own initiative, and then it's covered by the first sentence of uh, the first paragraph of Article 12, meaning that it may act. It has no duty, no obligation to act. It can pick and choose the cases uh, the Commission wants to, to act upon. Or uh, based on a complaint, on a formal complaint, and then we fall under the second sentence of Article, Article 12. Yeah. Then, what happens? As I said, if it's an ex-officio, the Commission enjoys uh, full discretion in whether to act or not, meaning that it could look into the matter and decide that the matter is not relevant, not interesting, that uh, the distortion of competition seems not to be there, seems not to be relevant, 
uh, so on and so forth, and simply stop there. A different story is when uh, it, the, the entry point is a complaint. At that point, if it's a, gen a genuine complaint, meaning a complaint that is submitted by an interested party who has filled all the fields of the uh, complaint form, which is not that, uh, that difficult to do, pointing to the existence of illegal aid, at that point, the Commission is under a duty to act, as uh, quite strongly made clear by the Court of Justice in the uh, Commission Ryanair case, uh, in which the Commission tried to resist to Ryanair pressure to, to, to act by saying that uh, actually Ryanair simply wrote a letter saying, actually it was uh, Mr. O'Leary uh, in person, writing a letter to the then uh, Vice President Almunia, uh, telling him, look, uh, there is state aid to, to what, a flag carrier company uh, in a southern country, um, not giving any other type of information. That was it. I think that's state aid and you should do something because it's outrageous. The Commission tried to say, okay, but uh, come on, this is not really, we cannot qualify that a complaint. Uh, it gives no information, it gives no reasons why as to that measure should be stated, and the court clearly said, no, 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 no. Uh, the procedural regulation as it stood at the time said that when you receive a complaint, you have to act on Actually, that when you know of illegal aid, you have to act on it, and you have to act on it. If you have no sufficient information, you go to the member state, ask for it, and investigate it, and then conclude it by way of a decision. Today, as I said, such a letter, uh, we were half jokingly saying that a postcard from the seaside would qualify as a complaint. Uh, such a letter would not qualify as a complaint any longer. Uh, there should be uh, information as to what the measure is about, why the complainant thinks that measure constitutes state aid, and also a number of other informations, the pieces of information. So, uh, as I said, if the uh, letter that the Commission receives qualifies as a complaint, the Commission must act, must investigate it. Uh, if not, what happens is basically that we fall back into an ex officio or a possible ex officio, meaning that the Commission still has the information in his hands and can decide what to do with it, can decide whether uh, it, <coughs> want to act on it, it wants to act on it or, or it doesn't because it thinks that the matter is not relevant uh, enough. So when the Commission decides or is obliged to, to act, what happens? Basically, the, the procedure that the Commission has to go through is exactly the same as for notified aid, but for some differences. So the differences are that when the, we are in an illegal aid scenario, the Commission has a bit more power in, uh, in its hands and can issue information injunctions, can issue a suspension injunction, meaning can tell the member state even not having fully assessed the measure, you should stop it there. Until I get to my final decision, you should not grant any support, which I presume being aid at this stage to anybody. Or in some extreme cases, a recovery injunction. Uh, as you see, it's quite an extreme case, has never been done so far, also because the requirement under the procedural regulations for doing so are quite straight. There must be no doubts as to the aid, measure, uh, aid nature of the measure, uh, serious doubts about compatibility, and also there, is, there should be a sort of periculum in mora, meaning there should be an urgency to act. Quite a high threshold, normally when you reach that threshold, you have enough information to adopt the final decision, and you adopt the final decision. Which is easier. You don't adopt two when you can adopt the last one already. Uh, as said, you adopt final decision because, as uh, said by the court in Natinaiki and also repeated by the court in uh, Ryanair that we were quoting before, the only way the Commission can say a final word on this type of procedures is by way of adopting a formal decision. 
what kinds of formal decisions can the Commission adopt? Exactly the same kinds of formal decisions that the Commission can adopt at the end of the notified aid process. So at the end of the preliminary investigation, a NOID uh, decision, we looked into it. The elements of 1071 are not fulfilled with NOID. We looked into it. They are fulfilled, but it's clear compatible aid because it complies. There are no doubts that the measure is covered by a set of guidelines or is compatible under the treaty. Or at the end of the formal investigation, maybe because the measure has been modified in the meantime, or because the information that the Commission has gotten in the framework of the formal investigation in which some more formal um, steps are to be undertaken, the uh, conclusion is that, again, it's no aid or it's compatible aid or it's compatible subject to the member state implementing some conditions. Or the most extreme, which is also the source of my daily work, uh, a negative decision ordering the recovery of the uh, illegality. I think that ends also logically the uh, section of uh, the procedure for legal aid. Are there any questions on this? <coughs> no? So we move to the next procedure, which is the procedure for misuse of aid. The procedure for misuse of aid. Uh, so what are we talking about in the first place? We're talking about a case in which the wrongdoer is not the member state. So the member state has done nothing wrong. It has given aid to a certain beneficiary based on a measure which was either block exempted or duly approved by the Commission. So fully in the clear. But when it gave the aid to the beneficiary, then the beneficiary did not comply with some of the conditions that were attached to the aid did not apply, uh, comply to uh, some of the conditions that were either in the legal basis or in the decision, uh, in the national legal basis or in the decision itself. Um, in such cases, the Commission has to do exactly what it would do in, a, um, in an illegal aid decision, uh, in an illegal aid decision. So it follows exactly the same procedure. It has to it may decide to, to, to open because we are not, or, uh, sorry, it may decide to open if it, it's a ex officio or it has to open if a, it's a complaint. So we are exactly in the same framework as, as before. And then if it's obliged to open or decides to open the investigation, the investigation ends exactly the same way as the illegal aid investigation, meaning no, no aid, no objection, compatible aid. <coughs> conditional decision or negative again with recovery because uh, the uh, aid is not compatible as used by the, the beneficiary. We have rushed a bit through this one, but the, the misuse of aid procedure is really just a copy paste of the legal aid procedure except from the identity, except for the uh, identity of the wrongdoer that gives rise to, 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 the, to the use of the Existing aid. As I said, starting this presentation, this is the only procedure for really looking into existing aid. And it's, sad, it's so, also because the, the and the, because it's so is the only article that of the procedural regulation that actually refers to uh, 1081 of the treaty. So for, for, or to the obligation of Commission and member states to uh, keep under constant control all system of uh, of aid. Uh, why should the uh, Commission and the member states keep control of something that was already controlled before, uh, meaning that it was either cleared by the Commission because it was approved by, by decision, or uh, that was considered to be compatible because it was uh, block exempted uh, before. Simply because the market change. The market changes uh, over time. The conditions on the market change. So something that could be no aid at one point or could be clearly compatible at one point uh, could become, over time, 
no longer compatible with the market or uh, become uh, aid due to the changes in the in the market. So I will again not go through the uh, various articles of the legal basis. I leave uh, them to you uh, to to read and go straight to uh, to the to the process. As I said, it's a cooperative procedure between the Commission and the Member State. And when the Commission thinks that something that is out there, and this is out there legally, so we are totally moving apart from the previous <coughs> procedure, the legal aid and misuse of aid procedure, it's out there on its own, own right, but it has become problematic over, over time, either because it has become aid or because it has become less clearly compatible. When the Commission reaches that conclusion, it has to inform the Member State of its preliminary conclusions and give the Member State the opportunity to comment. So the, the question would be, in such a way, uh, for example, let's say, let's take a real life example, this sector was once a monopoly, it has become liberalized over time, is the story of the telecom and energy sectors over, over time. Uh, the opening, the li European liberalization uh, of those sectors has had as a consequence that some of the financial arran arrangements between the member state and the then monopolist became problematic over time. And so the Commission can go to the member state and tell, yes, the way you were remunerating your monopolist was fine when there was no competition on that market. I don't think it's still fine now that the market is, because of EU legislation, fully liberalized. The member state can say, no, uh, I think it's still fine because, for example, I'm remunerating uh, uh, green energy in a perfectly market conformity. Uh, at that point, the Commission would react to the view of the Member State and would send a Member State a second letter in which either the Commission says, yeah, okay, we agree, you're right, uh, there is no problem, or we think that there are problems and the scheme as such, the measure as such, uh, doesn't look uh, compatible with the internal market. So we tell you what we think are the amendments to the scheme that can go up until the entire repealing of the scheme uh, that would be necessary to make that measure compatible or to take that measure out of the market because there is no way to, to make it compatible. That letter, the second one, meaning the one pointing to problems, can have either of two outcomes. The member say state shares the view of the Commission, it accepts basically the remedies that the Commission has proposed and uh, tells exactly the Commission that, then the Commission records that agreement, <coughs> it records that agreement also by publishing it on the, with a notice on the official journal so that all market operators are aware that the member state has committed to doing something and has committed to certain conditions for making that measure compatible and the member state is bound by uh, its agreement. Or the member state can, of course, is fully free to disagree with that, uh, with that assessment of, by the Commission. Again, the only way for the Commission then to uh, address this disagreement and moreover to address the fact that it still thinks that the measure is not compatible so that by not acting by the member state not acting the problem on the internal market would stay there and would have to do that opening formal investigation which again would need to end in a, uh, with a decision a decision which can be Again, sorry, uh, you were right, it was still no aid. Uh, yeah, you might have also tweaked it a bit in meanwhile and it has become compatible, or it was compatible from the very beginning and we were wrong 
in uh, indicating you some amendments to make it compatible, or, and that's the outcome that is closest to the, the, the letter that gives rise to, to this procedure, it is compatible provided that you do this, that, and the third thing, which is exactly normally what the, the first letter says. So to make it compatible, you need to amend it that way, and that would be a con uh, conditional decision, or there is no way this can be made compatible, and so you should discontinue it. More or less, you would recognize the uh, outcomes. It's, of course, only the second part of the outcome. There is no preliminary investigation here. The preliminary investigation is the first phase that we have seen, the sending of the exchange of letters. That's it for the preliminary investigation. The commission goes directly to the formal investigation. So it's only the last set of outcomes that, uh, that we have seen for illegal aid and misuse aid. Uh, you might have already noticed that in the last bullet point there is a difference, though, because in the uh, existing aid procedure there is no recovery. The aid was existing and it's protected until the Commission adopts the final decision. So whatever has been granted and up until that time is still to be considered existing aid and since recovery is only recovery of legal aid, because that's what Article 16 of the procedure, uh, the procedure regulation says, there can be no recovery. Of course, this no recovery has a caveat. And the caveat being that the member state is obliged to discontinue the scheme, usually within a quite short term. If the member state does not discontinue the scheme, that scheme becomes automatically illegal. And then we are back to square one. Recovery can come back into play. From that, from that point? Only from the moment of the decision. No. Only from the moment of the decision. Because only from the moment of the decision, all recipients of the aid are put on notice the TAID aid is no longer existing aid. If we go back to the first, the first part of our discussion, existing aid means approved, block exempted, or, but that's a bit residual, aid that has become exist, existing due to the elapsing of the time limit period for its recovery. It's really about. Sector inquiries are about a situation in which the Commission has a reasonable suspicion that something wrong is systematically going, uh, sorry, sorry, that something is systematically going wrong in a number of member states. As regards a sector of the economy or a type of aid measure. So, let's say the easiest way is to use the only sector inquiry that has been carried out so far. So a sector of the economy in which the Commission was not entirely sure that everything was stated compliant in the internal market was the remuneration of capacity mechanism uh, in the energy sector around Europe. So the Commission had run into a number of these capacity mechanisms and prima facie it looked like <coughs> they were not entirely unproblematic. Uh, what happened is that since capacity mechanisms were also a relatively new animal from a real market point of view, because they basically are born because of the huge, uh, the, the huge increase in the use of uh, non-reliable res, uh, res energy, so you need some backup capacity that was not necessary before. What the Commission decided to do was not to address one by one, or not in the first place, to address one by one those capacity mechanisms, but to get a better sense of what was going on out there on the market and uh, see whether the way these uh, aid measures, with this type of aid measures, was implemented in a number of member states was compatible with, with the market. And how does the Commission do so? Basically, the Commission sends a number of requests for information to the member states, to a number of member states normally, and the number of undertakings in those, in those member states. It collects 
the, uh, the replies, it looks into the replies and draws up a preliminary report, even if the word preliminary is not used in the procedural regulation while doing it, we found out that this could only be a preliminary report and publishes it. Publishes it and invites all interested parties in the union to comment on it, and meaning all member states who have replied to the questions or even member states that were not the addressees of those questions or the uh, same goes for, for the undertakings. All market operators are uh, allowed to, to reply. Then it takes account of all these comments. It starts from its preliminary report and then publishes a final one, which is basically the, sum, the summing up of its preliminary findings and the new findings due to the replies to the, to the public consumption. As I said in the very beginning, this is not, formally speaking, a procedure. It's simply a fact, a knowledge gathering instrument in the end of the Commission, precisely for those situations in which it would be inappropriate to start opening procedures because the knowledge of the market or the knowledge of the aid measures or the knowledge of the behavior of the different member states is probably perceived not to be enough. Which means that any concrete follow-up would have to be done under one of the procedures that we have discussed before. So if member states notify under a notified procedure, but mostly it would be under illegal aid uh, procedures, under ex officio illegal aid procedure, meaning that from the fact gathering, the commission would have in its hands information and it, might, it may decide, as uh, provided for by Article 12, uh, one first sentence, it may decide to open uh, illegal aid procedures on those uh, on the information that on that information that it got in this.